Good morning. Let it never be said the preacher is late for everything. We're early this morning. Look at that. Uh, I, I, I loved the uh, kids bringing the palms down the center aisle this morning. Uh, in case you haven't figured it out, today is Palm Sunday. If that slipped your attention, that's what that's about, just in case you missed it. Uh, I did have to laugh, chuckle to myself, though, as I saw Knox walking down the aisle like this. And I thought, oh, Cameron, when she was a little girl. <laughs> See, the funny thing is, Cameron just thought I was going to say, I miss Will. And I do, but. I feel like that's yeah. <laughs> no, Will would have walked down like this and then thrown him and walked away. So there you go. Yeah. You at least did it. Good morning, Will. Hopefully you're on Facebook this morning. We do have uh, a number of uh, things as we begin our service this morning. First of all, good morning. It is good to have each of you here today. I'm glad that you are here. I'm glad that you are making the choice to come into worship uh, today. We have a number of announcements I want to uh, bring to your attention this morning. First of all, if you did not receive a prepackaged uh, communion thing uh, this morning, now would be a good time. If you didn't pick one up, uh, we can certainly get one to you, or if you'd rather you're on the table back there in the, in the foyer. Uh, just uh, let me know, let Bill know, we can get something to you. Uh, looks like we're good, thank you, good job. Uh, the Christian Education Committee is meeting this Tuesday at 6 p.m. If you are wondering this morning, am I on the Christian Education Committee? Uh, well, I don't know, Cameron, do we have a list of the people who are on the Christian Education Committee? Sure, if you have it. These are the people on the Christian Education Committee. First of all, Sam and me. There's two. Cameron. Ed, Karen, Robert, Radine, Pam, Rachel, Let's make it easy. Have you ever taught a Sunday school class in our church? Are you currently teaching a Sunday school class in our church? There you go. <laughs> I had to ask that second question when Sally's hand went up. Oh, okay. Are, are you currently teaching a Sunday school class in our church? Uh, it'll, pretty much for Sunday school teachers, that's who's going to be at the Christian Education Committee. We will be discussing a number of things coming up throughout the rest of this year, including Vacation Bible School, as well as a few other topics that are on the agenda, and we will be getting that information back to you very shortly. The Sopleship Study Wednesday night will be here at the church in the Fellowship Hall at 7 p.m. You can also join us if you're uncomfortable coming to, uh, to the Fellowship Hall and being in person. You can also join us uh, on Zoom, and that invitation is, uh, is of course, mailed out. Uh, an email invitation is emailed out every week, so please check that. If we do not have your email address and you would uh, like to receive that information, please let me know after the service or or Sam, or, or someone, let us know. Make sure that we get a copy of your email address. Next Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. It's Easter already. Wow. Next Sunday, Easter Resurrection Celebration. We will be together this year. Last year, I, I knew last year when all of this was first starting up, I thought, by Easter, it's all going to be over. We will be in-person Easter. And then we ended up having a Zoom sunrise service. <sighs> I'm so glad that we will not be having a Zoom sunrise service this year. We might offer it additionally. We haven't talked about it. I don't know. But my plan is to be in-person right out here. I know. Just throw another. Let's, let's just let's invite everybody. It's a trap. It's a trap. Yeah, it's a trap. Don't do it. Uh, Easter sunrise service next Sunday morning, 7 o'clock, and then our regular morning worship at 1045 here in the sanctuary also. Uh, so we will uh, be together next Sunday for those two services. General Conference is uh, continuing uh, to be planned for April 29th through May the 1st, and that will be at our Colleyville, uh, Colley what in the world? Colleyville Bethel Methodist Church. And uh, if you have any uh, uh, any need for directions or anything like that, please let me know if you've not been receiving those uh, um, 
those emails from the Colleyville Church, please let me know if you're interested in, uh, in attending our general conference. If you want to be a delegate for general conference and you are a member in good standing, I encourage you to write your name on the board, on the piece of paper there on the board in the, in the fellowship hall. And if you want to know what it takes to be a member in good standing, talk to me after the service. Our offering basket is at the door. Um, we appreciate, once again, all of the support that you have all shown to us, uh, to this local church, to the ministries of this local church. We've been able to continue to support our, the food pantry for our, our local ministry. We've been able to support our, our foreign missionaries. Uh, we've been, we haven't missed anything in all of that, and that's so much thanks to your continued support, your continued generosity. Thank you. Thank you all. If you have any other, uh, for more information, if you have any questions that you'd like to uh, to have answered, probably BethelMethodist.com slash Robinson is the place to do that. I encourage you to check that out. And if you have anything else that you'd like to ask me about after the service, please catch me and you can do that. As we go into our service this morning, first of all, we are grateful to God that he has brought us here. I walked into the sanctuary this morning and turned on the lights, and uh, uh, Psalm 100 started running through my head. I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. Having that memory, having those, those thoughts run through your head as you're preparing for worship, it's a great way to get your mind, your spirit ready to meet with God's people, to meet with God. And so this morning, as we come together, we do that very thing. Let us pray. Father, direct our thoughts toward you. Each of us came in here this morning with with things weighing on us. Maybe it was the the calendar of events that we have for today or throughout the rest of this week. Maybe we have a busy week in front of us. Maybe we have a normal week and we're just being lulled into complacency by, by the same old thing every single day. Maybe, Father, we're going through times of great crisis times that could very easily distract us from you, take our attention away from from you and onto ourselves. Father, whatever it is that we walked into this place with this morning, we are grateful that we are here today in your presence, meeting with you here in this place, whether that's in person, whether that's online, knowing full well, Lord God, that as we humble our hearts before you, that you are at work in us, preparing us, molding us, shaping us, getting us ready to hear from you, getting us ready, Lord God, to respond to you. You are helping our hearts, Lord God, to, to hear your voice. You're helping our ears, Lord God, to understand and to perceive. You're helping our minds to reason and to ration that which is right and real. And you're directing our steps, Lord God to take all that we know to be true about you back out into this world. And all of that starts right now. Thank you, Father, as we begin this service together this morning. Thank you for your faithful presence with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 118, one and 2 and 19 through 29. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let Israel now say his mercy endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them, and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you, for you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, 
for his mercy endures forever. Let's stand together. We'll sing hymn number 300, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. Before thy passion They sang their hymns of praise To thee now high exalted Our melody we raise Thou didst accept their praises Accept the praise we bring Who in all good delightest Thou good and gracious King. Amen. You can be seated. One of the great privileges that we have every week is praying for one another, having the opportunity to bring those, those needs before God, to be reminded of the fact that we all, love that opportunity not only to be prayed for but to pray for one another and that is i think an example of the love of god that god pours into our hearts so this morning as we go to prayer there are a few uh, specific folks that i would ask you to be praying for not only today but throughout the rest of this week um, continue to pray for sue i know that sue and her family uh, and sue's ongoing treatment they have some some big decisions on the immediate horizon, so continue to pray for Sue. We're so glad that you're here again this morning, lady. It's good to see you. Uh, continue to pray for Jim. Uh, Jim Stewart is having some, uh, uh, continues to have some health things. We ask that you would, uh, the fam his family is asking us to, uh, to be praying for Jim, and I encourage you to do that also this week. Uh, I was told of uh, someone who many of us might know, some of us might remember, um, the Boatman family, Yvette Boatman, uh, who's the daughter of uh, the pastor from years ago up at Robinson Drive United Methodist Church. Uh, Yvette was in a very serious car wreck, and uh, she is in the hospital. I was told this morning, you said ICU, is that right, Phyllis? So uh, we'll certainly be praying for Yvette this morning and uh, asking God for his uh, for his healing touch and his mercy upon her during this time. We have others, of course, uh, we remember. Uh, I know that a number of folks are, are getting their second round of, uh, of shots, and some of those are having some, some side effects, some issues that folks weren't quite expecting. Uh, Mary Oliver and, and uh, her son Todd had their second shot this past week. Uh, Mary hopes to be back in church next week. Uh, Louise Frosch told me that, that she misses us. She's had her second shot now. She plans on being back in church next week. I'm excited about the, the possibility of folks starting to come back again. So glad that we've had the opportunity to be broadcasting and posting on Facebook and those kinds of, of things, but so glad that we can be back in, in person again as much as we can. I would ask you on a personal note to be in prayer for, uh, for my family. Rachel and Jack are not here this morning. Rachel uh, got sick last night and uh, hate, hated to miss this morning, but uh, certainly ask you to pray for Rachel and for Jack uh, during this next week. As we come to God in prayer, we first of all confess that we are a needy people. We recognize, we recognize that God is the one who is able to meet that need. 
to work in a way that goes beyond anything that we can begin to think or to understand. Often the greatest work that God does is not in the physical, but in the spiritual. Can God heal? Absolutely. There are times that God does a greater work than the healing of our bodies, and that's the redirecting of our spirits. That's in the the healing of our spirits, and we are grateful that God is concerned with every aspect of our lives. Let us pray this morning. Father, as we come to you, we recognize that you alone can meet our need. We know, Father, that there are needs among us. Sometimes those are, are, are obvious as people are going through times of illness or, or, or going through times of treatment. And sometimes, Father, those things are not so obvious. As when there is the, the growing and lingering uncertainty. If God really is God, then why the pain in my life? Why the issues that I see in the world around us? Father, this morning, we recognize again that you are God, and that you are working in ways that go beyond our ability to understand. We recognize, Lord God, that that you have provided all that we need to be in a right relationship with you, to be made right with you, and all of that is available through Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that the healing that you bring to our lives is focused not only on the physical, but on the spiritual as well. Thank you, Lord God, for the, for the forgiveness of sins. Thank you, Father God, for being restored to you in a right relationship. Thank you, Father, for all of those things. We do pray for those among us this morning, Lord God, who are having uh, times of sickness, times of illness. We especially lift to you this morning, Sue and, and uh, Jim. We ask, Father, that you will work in the lives of both of these folks. I know that there are others among us, Lord God, who, have, who are going through times of, uh, of testing, times of trial, times of pain. We continue to, to pray for, for Judy. We continue to pray for Shalon, for, for, for Sally, for Donna, for others, Lord God, that you will continue to touch and heal and help in every way. And Father, as we find ourselves going through those times of struggle, going through those times of questioning, I pray, Father, that you will in your still small voice, I whisper to each of our minds, to each of our spirits, and remind us, Lord God, that you alone are God and that you are with us. Hear us now, Father, as we join our hearts and our voices together, praying as Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand together. We'll sing hymn number 297, Hosanna, Loud Hosanna. And a loud hosanna, the little children sing through pillared court and temple, the lovely anthem rang to Jesus who had blessed them, close folded to his breast. The children sang their praises. The simplest and the best from all event they followed in an existent crowd the victor palm branch waving and chanting clear and loud the lord of earth and heaven rode on in holy state nor scorn that little children should on his bidding wait. Hosanna in the highest, that ancient song we sing. For Christ 
Christ is our Redeemer, the Lord of heaven, our King. Oh, may we ever praise Him with heart and life and voice, and in His blissful presence eternally rejoice. Amen. Let's remain standing for our affirmation of faith. The Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. Our New Testament reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 11. We, we picked up on hints of what's in this passage in that last hymn that we sang, the idea of the king of heaven choosing to humble himself, to ride on, on a lowly donkey. Listen for, for those aspects of humility and the choice that Jesus made. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's stand and sing our next hymn together. <coughs> Him is in your bulletin this morning. Hail thou was despised Jesus, hail thou Galilean King, thou didst suffer to release us, thou didst free. By God appointed, all our sins and thee were laid. By almighty love anointed, thou hast full atonement made. All thy people are forgiven through the virtue of their blood. The gate of heaven, peace is made between us and God. Jesus, dream the throne in glory, there forever us abide. All the heavenly hosts adore thee, only at thy Father's side. It 
interceding till in glory we appear worship honor power and blessing thou art worthy to receive highest praises without ceasing pride it is for us to give help ye bright angelic spirit bring your sweetest noblest days help us sing of jesus merit help to chant emmanuel's praise amen you can be seated You may have noticed that the gospel passage that we're used to hearing on this day, on Palm Sunday, we, we didn't hear today. We didn't read that gospel passage. Oh, well, there's some reasons for that. We heard it again and again throughout the songs that we sang. But also, we, we have a tendency when we, when we hear stories like that it, through the gospels, we, we've heard them for all of our lives and we hear those things and uh, we think to ourselves, oh, we know how the story goes, and we quit listening. I think our Wednesday night study this past week, our Wednesday night discipleship study, kind of brought some of those things to light. We preached last week from, um, from the story of David and Goliath, and Sam asked the question Wednesday night. In this whole chapter that we looked at last Sunday morning, how many sermons can we find? And we found at least, at least 10, if not a dozen different sermons that we could have preached, different angles, different focuses, different ideas that go through that entire story. It's amazing to me whenever we hear those stories again, perhaps stories that we've heard forever, but when we hear them again, we understand, we see things that maybe we didn't see before. And so this morning, instead of just reading, we wanted to be reminded of the events of that Palm Sunday through the songs that we sang, through through the scriptures, or through the different things that, that we saw in our service and not just reading from that gospel story. But in that gospel story, we hear again that story of the Palm Sunday, that first Palm Sunday, or that triumphal entry celebration. And the point of that that we want to pull out this morning and see for ourselves is that this truly was a celebration. This was, as the one hymn said, this was that long-expected Jesus. This was that one who has come to set God's people free. This is the Hosanna that we we talked about from the Psalms, the the save now idea. This was This was the image of Jesus coming and being that king that the people needed, that the people wanted, that they longed for, and that they desired to have. They wanted to have that king that would come and set all things right. They wanted to to have that one who again was going to, to bring glory to Israel. Little did they realize that in all of the celebration and all of the things going on, and all of the, the stuff that was happening that day as Jesus rode into Jerusalem, that when we read through that story again, we can hear, we can see some of those storm clouds on the horizon, some of those things that are going on behind the scenes. For example, the, the idea of Jesus coming and being that, that king, the one who was going to sit on David's throne. God had a much higher throne for Jesus to sit on and a much higher ambition than simply throwing the Romans out of Israel. God had a plan to deal once and forever with the issue of sin and to bring an end to the exile that had separated humanity from God. And so we have that bigger thing going on in all of the celebration. Another one of the storm clouds that we see on the horizon is in Luke's gospel. We hear Jesus weeping over Jerusalem as he rides from Mount Olivet toward Jerusalem. 
oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if you had known. The thing is, they should have known. They had the scriptures. They had everything they needed. They had Moses and the prophets. They should have known what God was doing, what God was going to accomplish. But instead, there became a focus upon themselves, much in the same way that we often struggle with that same issue. We turn the focus upon ourselves. What has God done for me lately? Instead of looking at the much larger question of how is it that God, who has worked in the past, who will work in the future, how is God working here and now in this moment? Another one of the storm clouds that we see is how the temple leaders are telling Jesus that he must silence the shouting of Hosanna or save now. They don't really give a clear reason for the silencing. Maybe there was an idea that there was some blasphemy going on. Maybe it's the fear of the Romans. Finally, we see the storm cloud of Jesus Jesus' actions in the temple as he goes into the temple, as he overturns the tables of the money changers. This action of Jesus exposes the hypocrisy and the greed of the people involved, and it brings the whole system of sacrifice to a grinding halt, even if it's just for a little while. Might this be foreshadowing of Jesus offering himself as the complete sacrifice? made available to all who will receive him? Might this demonstrate that Jesus will be the sacrifice that is not needed to be offered again, as the writer to the Hebrews said, not needing to be offered on a yearly basis, but offered once and for all, because it was the sufficient, right sacrifice. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross would open the way for the sins of all who come to Jesus to be forgiven. Jesus' death on the cross will provide the way for the separation and exile from God that sin causes to be broken, for the power of sin to be overthrown. But wait, that's next Sunday sermon. So how does this triumphal entry tie back to our series regarding David and Jesus? If we were talking about David and Goliath like we were last week, then we could easily draw some parallels. But today's message deals with David and that other person who is most often associated with David, Bathsheba. The story is found in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Let's read the opening lines. I told Sam uh, Wednesday night, so we read the entire chapter of David and Goliath last week. I said the good news is this week it's two chapters that our story takes place in. We're only going to look at the first three verses of chapter 11. Verse 1, it happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed, walked on the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Just like in the triumphal entry passage, there are some dark storm clouds (laughs) gathering as we read these three verses. The first storm cloud has to do with David's location. Did you hear in verse 1? It was the spring of the year when kings go out to battle. But David is in Jerusalem. Wait a minute. David sends his army, his general. He sends them all out. He says, you guys go fight. It's the right time of year. It's the time that we do this. It's the time when the rain has stopped and, it's, and, the, and the fields are planted, but there's not a harvest to get in yet. So now's the time to, uh, to take care of our, our fighting and, and our political things that need to be done. So you guys go to war. I'll sit here and wait to, hear, to see how it goes. It's very unlike David. David is usually the guy at the front of the army. David is always the one who is involved somehow in the action of, of battle. David is, after all, that, that warrior poet king that, we, that we've come to know and to love so much throughout this entire series. But for whatever reason, and we're not told why, perhaps it was illness, 
Perhaps it was the affairs of state. Perhaps there was some legitimate reason that David stayed back in Jerusalem. We don't know. All we know for certain is that David is in Jerusalem while the rest of the army is out fighting David's battles, fighting out there while David is back home again. That's the first storm cloud. And because David is where he is, instead of being where the king was supposed to be, a door gets opened for the next level of the storm that is to come. <clears throat> David's location then reveals a second storm cloud, if you will. David is separated from the people he's usually around. If this past year of physical separation and of social distancing has taught us anything, it's taught us how much we miss just being with one another. Yes, sometimes it's nice to take a break, and it's nice to just kind of sit back and, and relax and not have to worry about anything and wear our special stretchy pants and not have to go anywhere. But there comes a point where that gets to be too much, where we need interaction with other people. Donna, I expected an amen at that point. <laughs> you all know what I'm referring to. You know that, that sense of, of separation, of loneliness, of anxiety that starts to build in because we're not with the people we love. We're not with the people who love us. Again, there can be some very legitimate reasons for our, our separation. But regardless of how legitimate those reasons might be, this is still a reality. The separation from one another is a reality that we've had to face. David is separated from the people who are usually around him. You might be hearing echoes in your mind of First Peter, where Satan is described as a lion seeking who he might devour. If you've watched any wonderful world of Disney, if you've watched any of those animal specials, <clears throat> you know... <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> you know that the prey animal who is most vulnerable to the attack of the lion is the prey animal, the gazelle, the, the whatever it is, who's off by himself. He's not paying attention. He's wandered off from the herd. He's probably texting and walking at the same time, not paying attention to where he is or what's going on around him. And he gets out there and boom, he's lunch. That's what happens. When we get separated for an extended period of time from the people who love us and know us and pray for us and who continue to be that, that source of church family for us, when we get separated from those people, we start to look like prey for the enemy of our souls. And we start to look vulnerable. And we start to lose our focus we start to lose our focus upon God, and we start instead to turn our attention, turn our eyes only to ourselves. And that's a dangerous place to be. We become most vulnerable to temptation and to sin when we are separated from one another. Again, another quote from Hebrews that comes to mind is that quote from Hebrews chapter 10 that says that you, you should not choose to be separated from worshiping with one another for any extended period of time. If you can help it, come together as often as possible. Ample opportunities arise when we're separated from one another for our eyes to get fixated on something other than God. Often our eyes get fixated upon ourselves. David's eyes got fixated upon Bathsheba. There have been those over the years who have suggested that Bathsheba was at fault because she seduced the king. She should have known not to go where she went. She should have known not to do what she was doing in full view of the palace. That's completely missing the point. I want to go on record this morning as saying that Bathsheba is not to blame. There's no hint of blame that's laid on Bathsheba in this entire event. Culturally, she is doing what was done. The roof of the house was a private area where private things were taken care of. If you live in, a, in an arid, almost desert area, you go to a place where there's going to be a breeze. 
you go to a place where or you can kind of get out of the heat, and that's what happened on the rooftops. You had shades that were that were put up. You had coverings uh, that provided some cloth coverings that provided for some shade. You had an area where you could get a breeze more so than you could downstairs or outside uh, in the streets. And so you would go to this to this rooftop patio area, essentially, where it was a little bit cooler and a little bit more bearable. It was a private area. And this is the part of the house where private events took place. And what David is witnessing is that which is supposed to be a private event. The fault of all of this falls upon David. When David came around the corner, remember, David's not even supposed to be in Jerusalem at this time, but he is for whatever reason. He gets up from his nap. He starts walking around and looking over the city, and he gets to this particular point, and he looks down, and he goes, oh, and he should have, in that moment, gone, oh my, and turned around and gone to the other side and turned away. But a glance became a lingering gaze. And David didn't just glance anymore. David started to behold. That's the word that we find in our scripture passage this morning. And in that process, when a, when a, when a glance, an accidental glance became a moment to behold, something happened. That lingering gaze allowed a temptation to be born in the heart of David. And temptation then, instead of being dealt with at the level of temptation, that temptation was allowed to grow, and it became sin. James chapter 1 says it this way, But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. It's almost as if, it's almost as if James had been reading this story when God put those words upon the heart of James to write. David has made the choice to keep looking. And now he makes the choice to act in a way that abuses the position and the authority that God has given to David. The word sent is used nine times in chapter 11. Six of those times, it's David who is sending. And three other times, others are sending information back to David that further exposes the depth of David's sin. The point is, David has chosen to put himself in the place of power. He is the one who is sending. He is the one who is controlling. He is the one who is manipulating. He is the one who is driving everything else in this story. David has chosen that place of power. And choosing this place of power pushes David even further away from God. The rest of the story shows David going from lusting to adultery to murder. By the end of the chapter, we're left wondering what happened to that young man from last week, who was so full of God that there was no room for fear of Goliath to creep into his mind or his spirit. If the story was over at the end of chapter 11, we would say, what a horrible tragedy. Isn't that the way that happens with with all kings and politicians? Isn't isn't that just the way? That happens with preachers too. It happens with Sunday school teachers, and it happens with people just walking down the street at times. We see something, our gaze, it's, our gaze lingers, it becomes alluring, it entices us. And before we know it, what started out, what should have been a moment where we go, oh, and walked away, turns into a time when we say, yes, that's what I want, that's what I need, that's what I have to have at any cost. But the story isn't over at the end of chapter 11. We have to listen to chapter 12, verse 1. Because it's important for us to hear these words. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David. I want you to notice now, who's doing the sending? God. The Lord sent Nathan to David. Nathan came to David and he said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. That's how the story starts. There's no once upon a time. There's nothing like that that implies that it's, that it's a false story of any kind. It's more like this, the parables that Jesus would tell. The stories that would start with, there was a certain man 
who walked out into his field and started casting seed to plant the seed. There was a certain man who went down the road heading from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among thieves. There was a certain man who had two sons. We recognize a parable formula and that's what's going on here. God sends Nathan to David with a parable. There were two men, one rich, the other poor. The story goes on, and a story grabs David's attention because it's a story about a poor man who owns a sheep, a young lamb. As the story's told, we find out that this lamb is not livestock. This lamb is a pet. This lamb cuddles. This man, this lamb sleeps in the bed with this man. This lamb is part of the family. His children love this lamb. This lamb is loved by this poor family, and it represents the most important thing that this family has in this world. The rich man has many flocks, not just many lambs, but many flocks from which to choose. Well, one day, the rich man has, has a friend who comes into town. Unexpected guests show up. And he needs to make a meal. And so he, he has seen the poor man with his pet lamb. And he sends a servant out. And he says, go and take for me the poor man's lamb. Kill it. Butcher it. Cook it. That's what we're having for dinner tonight. The heart of the shepherd becomes enraged. And David says, where is this man? Let me at him. I'm going to teach him what it means to take something that isn't his. This rich man thinks that he's in control. I'll tear him down a few notches. And God has Nathan deliver that aha, gotcha moment that every parable has. You are that man. Immediately, David knew that his sin was exposed. That everything that he had tried to cover up and hide and, and everybody who he could blackmail and push to the side, it was out there. God knew it. There was no getting away from it. The consequences of David's sin would carry on for multiple generations. But yet David's heart was broken and turned back to God, and David sought repentance for his sin. The exposure of David's sin is necessary in order for God's grace to be received. Do you realize that? You say, well, how come God couldn't just forgive David, just boom, forgive, done? Why did it all have to come to light? Why did David have to say anything at all? Because if David's sin had not been exposed, if David had never come to God with a humble and repentant heart, David would have remained in that position of thinking that David was the one in control, that David could be equal with God. And if you think things had already gotten messed up, they would have gotten even worse. David's sin is exposed. David's heart is broken. David comes to God with a repentant and humble heart in order to receive God's grace. We hear David's repentance every time we read Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God. So where is the tie-in? Where is the tie-in back to Jesus in Jerusalem? Well, here it is. Here's the tie-in from David and Bathsheba all the way back to Palm Sunday. The tie-in is that Jesus is the descendant. Jesus is the son of David that God had promised who would sit on the throne of David forever. It wasn't Solomon. It wasn't Absalom. It was Jesus who would be that son of David, that descendant of David who would rule on David's throne forever. David is the king who morally failed. Jesus is the king 
who is obedient to the will of the Father. While the hosannas still echo, we have to see that the cry for salvation cannot be met by earthly powers. Only God can bring the salvation that our spirits and our minds and our lives truly need. And God has brought that salvation in the person of Jesus, the one who is king of kings, the one who will reign in righteousness forever. The musicians are up for our final hymn, and we are prepared to receive communion together this morning. But before we sing our final hymn, before we receive communion together, listen again to some of the words from David's prayer. The prayer that David prayed after God exposed David's sin. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity, and I will be whiter than snow. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. May we make the words of this prayer our prayer as we sing our closing hymns together. Let's stand together as we sing. To be perfectly whole, I want you forever to live in my soul. Break down every idol, cast out every foe. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Just look down from your throne in the skies And help me to make a complete sacrifice I give up myself and whatever I know Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow Jesus, for this I most humbly entreat. I wait, blessed Lord, at your crucified feet. By faith for my cleansing, I see your blood flow. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Jesus, before you I patiently wait. Come now and within me a new heart create. To those who have sought you, you never said no. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. You are the power.
change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. Let us pray. Father, as we come to this point in our service where we have the elements and the opportunity for, uh, for remembering, we ask, Lord God, that you will indeed search us. Try our hearts, O oh God. See if there is any wicked way in us. Shine the light of your Holy Spirit upon our minds upon our spirits, upon our lives. Father, is there anything there that you see that displeases you? If so, Lord God, I pray that you will place your finger upon that now. Is it an action for which we need to repent and ask for your grace that we no longer pursue that action? Is it an attitude, Lord God, an attitude of mind or life that you were pointing out to us, an attitude where where we need to recognize that you call us to be examples of your love. Whatever it is, Lord God, I pray that you will have full opportunity here now in this moment to search us, to try us. Father, as we come to this moment, we remember we remember the meal that was, that was held. We remember what we have learned from that, what we have been taught through that moment of that supper together of Jesus with the disciples in the upper room. We remember, Lord God, that during the meal he took the bread. And you invite us now, Lord God, to take the bread. And we remember, Lord God, that as Jesus took the bread, he broke that bread in the, in, the, uh, in the presence of those disciples. And he said, this is my body, which will soon be broken for you. As often as you eat, remember me, take and eat. We remember, Lord God, that after the meal, Jesus raised the cup. And he said, this cup represents my blood, which will soon be shed for the forgiveness of your sins. As often as you drink of it, remember me, take and drink. Lord God, in such a simple act, an act of remembering, an act of drinking, an act of eating, we are reminded of the greatest gift ever. We are reminded, Lord God, that the one who exposes sin is also the one it offers grace and forgiveness. The one, Lord God, you. The one who redeems. You are the one, Lord God, in whom our hope and our trust resides. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. The closing song. Let's sing that together this morning before we're dismissed. Thank you. It's good to have you all here this morning. You are dismissed.